I am thrilled to be here this morning, uh, thrilled for a new series, and oh my goodness, Adrian is literally perched on the edge of her seat. <laughs> so I mentioned this last week, uh, a few people come up, had come up to me over the past couple of weeks, couple of months actually, and have said, hey, uh, why don't we do a series on Fruits of the Spirit? So when I had multiple people ask for sermon series on the fruits of the Spirit, I said, ooh, there's something going on here. Uh, we, we should talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And that's what I want to do over the next couple of weeks. I want to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And so I guess, I don't know, I've been thinking about this for at least three, four months. And when I started, I love it. You start a, a new series, you have an idea, you have something that, that you know you want to work with. You want to see what's there. You want to in investigate a bit, do some discovery. And I start, I always start with a blank page. And then I just start taking notes and whatever comes to mind. So for this, Fruits of the Spirit and well, what comes to mind. And I feel like I, I, I've i done a few Fruits of the, the Spirit sermons before in the past. And I said, well, I don't want to do it that way. Uh, I want to do something completely different. And I, oh my goodness, like what I came up with, I can't wait to share it with you all. I'm so excited uh, for this material and uh, what we're going to talk about. And today, uh, so I'm using the clicker the first time. Let's see if I go in the right direction here. Uh, I titled this sermon, does everyone have your material, your mystery material? Because you're not supposed to know exactly what the purpose of all these items are yet. Uh, so hopefully uh, you have your mystery material. And the title of this sermon is... Oh, I went the wrong direction. Eh, I knew it was going to happen. It's all good. It's called Empty Your Cup. And that's where we will begin our conversation on the fruits of the Spirit with a sermon titled Empty Your Cup. Now, let's begin by talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Let's look at, well, what are they? What are these nine qualities, these nine fruits? And so I chose to use the New Revised Standard Version translation because I feel like the words that they chose, the English words that they translated from the Greek, just they, they get a little more of the essence, a little better, I thought, than the NIV. I think we can understand these words a little better. So, NRSV translation. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, if you pull out the piece of paper that's in your cup, you'll find the same words written up here, right there on your piece of paper. Uh, the, this is your cheat sheet for the next couple of weeks. And here's my goal with this series. At the end of these few sermons, my goal is that you would experience all of these fruit to a greater degree. And just look through the list. Again, just, just glance at it. You should all have a copy of it right in front of you. Look at that. When you read these ways of being, because that's what they are. They're, they're particular ways of showing up in the world. Our mission here at Awaken is to be followers of Jesus, and I would argue that as we continue in our walk with Jesus, that these qualities would emerge more and more as we pursue the life that Jesus offers. And so if I were to ask you a question as we begin here this morning, look, look at that list. Uh, could any of you use some more of these ways of being in your life? And w when you read this list, you're like, yeah, I got them all, I'm good. Next. Or do you look at this list and you're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, I could use a little more patience. <laughs> right? I'm like right there. Like, yeah, totally. I got a five and two-year-old at home. Patience, whoo. Yeah. Could use a little more of that one at home. <laughs> so the goal is that, again, you would experience to a greater degree. And here's what I want us to do as we begin this series. I want you all to set your intentions on these ways of being. And here's what I mean by that. This piece of paper, I want you to carry it around with you over the next four or five weeks. I want you to put it on the refrigerator, microwave, maybe you have a bulletin board where you put artwork, uh, maybe you want to put it in the dashboard, bathroom mirror, wherever you're going to see these nine ways of being, 
I, I want them to be somewhere in front of you that you're going to see them all throughout these next couple of weeks. And I want you to focus on these nine qualities. So in a sense, I want us to say, okay, here's the type of life that I desire for myself to be a person of peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, generosity. Uh, let's focus here over the next couple of weeks. And uh, here's what I actually envisioned uh, for all of those who are artistic out there, which is all of us in our own way, right? Um, maybe there's a way for you to like nice calligraphy, write these out. Uh, maybe you want to do sidewalk chalk <laughs> in your driveway. Uh, maybe there's a way for you to illustrate these nine qualities. If you do that, take, please take a picture and send it. And we'll put it on our Instagram page. We'll display it here on a Sunday morning. Uh, just put it someplace where you're going to see it so you can remind yourself as you go through life uh, because life has a way of beating these nine qualities out of us, does it not? You know, we have our intention of saying, well, I'm going to be more loving. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and I, I want to be more of this. But then you have that 11 o'clock meeting with your boss, <laughs> and you walk out of that room, and love is the last thing on your mind. And so you need to be reminded of it. And so then you go back to your office, you go back to your desk, and you see these nine qualities. Like, okay, th th this is the path that I desire to walk. Okay, let me recenter myself. Let me refocus, and let me, let me set my intention here on this way of being. So have these somewhere front and center over the next couple of weeks. Now, as we begin, I want you to notice something. This word of, very, very important. These are fruits of what? The Spirit. So this phrase is extremely important as we begin this morning. Fruit of the Spirit. Because what this tells us, these are not fruits of your hard work. They're not fruits of your own strength. If I can just clench my fists and get through this, well, then I can somehow gain more love in my life. If I can just do the right things, make the right steps, go to the right places, talk to the right people, follow these six steps over here, well then, but no, no, no. These are fruits of the Spirit. Not of what you can achieve through your own power, your own striving. In other words, these are gifts that we receive. It's something different. Rather than seeking them externally, thinking, okay, do these things, then I'll gain more of this. Rather, they, they come as we open our hands, as we open our hearts, because these are gifts that the Spirit bestows to each of us. Gifts that emerge from within. So when I thought about this series, I said, okay, what I do not want to do is I do not want to give three ways to get more love in your life. I don't want to show you five ways to achieve more peace. All of that is helpful. It has its place, yes. But what I want to do is I want to talk about joining the life that's already flowing within you. Because I believe that all of these qualities, all of these fruits are already present deep, deep within you. So how then... Can we join the work that the Spirit is already up to in your life so that all of these qualities can emerge to a greater degree? They can bubble up from within and then just simply flow out of you. So let's begin with a question. Uh, but you know me. Sometimes I say a question and then I'm like, oh, here's another question to follow up that one. So uh, a question or two. And here are the, the two questions that I want to answer over the next, uh, I think it's going to be four weeks together. How do we cultivate a life receptive to these gifts? How do we live life in a way that our hands are open to receive greater degrees of patience, generosity? And I'm sure you look at that list and you can just target one or two of those. You're like, whoo, yeah, I need more of that one. Maybe you want to just simply set your intention on that one for these next couple of weeks. Like, well, if I could just move the dial and inch, a half an inch, a centimeter with, with this one fruit, well then, hey, we got to win. And that, that, that's cool. Well, let's just take progress, growth, however it happens to be. M maybe it seems really small and insignificant, but that one millimeter, okay, that, that's going to make life flow a little easier. And so uh, how do we cultivate a life receptive? And then how do we prepare space in our lives 
for these gifts. So I had a couple of illustrations. Uh, we could talk about a farmer tilling the soil before a, a farmer, uh, farmer uh, puts seed down before he wants to plant, uh, harvest fruits and vegetables. He'll put a seed, but he has to prepare the soil. But then I thought of an even better way because that's kind of generic and we talk about that all the time. So here's how we prepare space in our lives. Let's talk about the difference between a college frat party and high tea. If you are going to throw a college frat party, there's a particular way that you would prepare the space, is there not? Probably like clear everything out of the room, get a couple of tables set up, have a few kegs, uh, some solo cups. Uh, I don't know what else you're going to have at a col I didn't go to a college that had uh, frats, so uh, haven't gone to a college frat party, just what I've seen on old school. Uh, but you're going to prepare the space a particular way, are you not? Uh, Mateo, I'm not giving you any ideas, okay? Sorry, guys. Um, just, you know. Um, but now think about if you're going to host high tea at your home. It's going to look a little different than a college frat party, is it not? So what you're hoping to achieve, the atmosphere, uh, the environment that you're hoping to achieve, well, that's going to dictate how you prepare the space. So when we think about these nine qualities that you have right there in front of you, these fruits, if you desire to gain some more of these and exhibit them in greater ways in your life, well, then you're going to have to prepare the space in your hearts in a particular way so that you're open to receive so that you can create the type of environment, the atmosphere that is conducive to allowing those fruits to emerge from within. And that's what I want to talk about over the next couple of weeks. How do we prepare our inner space? Because that's where it always starts. Now, when I was in seminary, uh, I came across this idea that it, it has just stuck with me because this is something that had bothered me for years and years and it has to do with the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now I'm sure you're like, wait a second, fruits of the spirit, hardening of Pharaoh's heart. What in the world are we talking about? So uh, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart in Exodus is mentioned 20 times. 10 times uh, we're told that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Uh, ten other times, the, the rest of those ten times, we're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Twenty times, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Ten times by himself, ten times God allowed the hardening to continue. There was this synergistic relationship between God and Pharaoh. They were working in unison. God was allowing the path that Pharaoh was walking to continue. And this is something that has always stood out to me because I would always think, well, if God hardened Pharaoh's heart, well, then he had no chance. Well, of course, like, why, why would God harden someone's heart so that Pharaoh didn't live a life that God was desiring for him and actually walking in the opposite direction? But God was allowing Pharaoh to make his own decision. And what Pharaoh decided to do was walk in a way opposite the way in which God was leading him this way of justice for all people, uh, this way of love, this way of grace. Pharaoh decided that he was going to walk in a different direction. This is how I believe our relationship with God works. It works in synergy, cooperation. What I, what I believe is that God desires to give you all these fruits in abundance. How do we work with God? Remember, fruits of the Spirit. So how do we join with the Spirit? How do we soften our hearts so that we can see within us this life that the Spirit is desiring to give to each of us? Uh, there's a, uh, a Jewish story talking about farming, of course, right? Because when you live back in the day when uh, everything is about farming and you rely on farming for a living and to survive, everything is about farming. Uh, here's a story. And this was a, a story about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. The first farmer cultivates his land with great care. Rains come, sun shines, the crops grow. The second farmer refuses to work his land. The rains come, the ground turns to mud. Then the sun shines and the ground becomes as hard as clay. In a very real sense, God hardened the second farmer's land by sending the rain and then making the sun shine. But he, the farmer, also ruined his land by not working the land. 
You see the difference here? The rain came for both. God was providing that which is needed for crops to grow. The first farmer, he worked the land. He prepared it. He was open to receive the harvest. The second farmer is like, mm, no, I got better things to do. I'm just going to see what happens. So how do we prepare the space in our hearts so our hands are open to see greater love emerge from within? And here's the truth about life. Here's what I realized this week about life. All of life is synergistic in nature. This goes for you. See, I think the universe is founded in synergy. Uh, let's talk about your life for a moment. A couple of, uh, a couple of numbers for you. First one, 100 trillion. Anyone have any idea what 100 trillion in your body uh, have to do together? So 100 trillion, the number of uh, fungi and bacteria residing within just simply your gut right here at this moment. 100 trillion living organisms within your gut right now, digesting your food, <laughs> helping your body maintain optimal levels. Without those 100 trillion bacteria and fungi living within you, you would not be you because you wouldn't survive. You wouldn't be able to digest your food. So simply the fact that you're here, you're breathing, that you're moving around, that you're sitting in these seats, well, that has to do with the fact that residing within you are 100 trillion just simply in your gut. We're not talking about all the ones on your skin, scalp, everywhere else. Just in this one uh, area of your body, Without those 100 trillion organisms, you couldn't survive. Your life, your very essence, it's based on synergy. <laughs> Which then begs the question, well, what does it really mean to be human uh, if we have all these other organisms that are living within us and helping us grow and survive? Uh, let's look at, look at another number. So uh, the weight of five African elephants... At the end of your life, you will have carried within you, <laughs> kind of disgusting when you think about it, all the bacteria and fungi and all the other organisms that you would have carried with you at some point in your life, they will add up to the weight of five African elephants. <laughs> think about that for a minute. Life is synergistic in nature. It's cooperative. Without those organisms, you would not survive. And when you look back over your life, just picture five African elephants made up of all different bugs. And that's what you'll be leaving behind. That's what you've been leaving behind from the moment in which you were born. So all of life is synergistic, including our relationship with God. We work with the Spirit. We join with the Spirit in order to live this life that God desires for us to live. Uh, oops, wrong way again here. Uh, so here we are, fruits of the Spirit. How do we prepare the space? So I want to give you the first way to prepare the space in your lives. The first way is... To empty your cup. Kind of gave it away by the sermon title. I get it. Everyone has a cup. Here's something else I want you to carry with you over the next couple of weeks. I want you to carry this cup with you. I know, I've given you a lot of things. Uh, I promise you it's very light. All right. Uh, again, put it in a prominent place somewhere you're going to remember it so that you can always remember. Fruits, empty cup. There is this uh, a Chinese parable proverb that I heard years ago I thought was immensely profound. And it's the story of a wise Zen master. And people would travel to this Zen master from all over the nation because of the wisdom that he would pass on. So there's this high-ranking official who says, I need to go seek this Zen master out because there's something that he has. I, I want the wisdom that he can offer. So here's this high-ranking official, someone who is used to giving orders and getting what he wants. He travels hundreds, however many miles, to this master. And he says, hey, um, can, can you give me some wisdom? 
can, can you pass along some knowledge? And so the, the Zen master invites him into his little house. And he says, sure, let's begin by having tea. So they sit down, I'm assuming on the floor at this point. Uh, he offers a cup to this high-ranking official, brings out a teapot, begins pouring the tea into the cup. So this official is holding the tea, uh, holding his cup out while it's being poured, and he's watching, begins filling up, filling up, filling up. It's pretty much at the top. The master continues, to, like no sign of stopping, until eventually this official says, "Hey, hey, hey! Uh, do you, it's it's overflowing. Like you, you have to stop. There's too much here. Like stop, please." And so the Zen master stops. He looks at him and says. This cup is overfilling, just like your life. Come back to me when you've emptied your cup. Then we can talk. Your life is overflowing with too much. This, this overflowing cup is just like your life. When you've learned to empty the cup, then you will be ready to receive. But right now, you have no room in your life to receive because your life is too crowded. So how do we live with an empty cup? I took a picture a couple of weeks ago. Uh, here, is the front, oops, uh, here is the front of our house. Oh my goodness. Every single day I drove into the driveway and saw this bush. I had, I mean, my anxiety just spiked. Oh, or I would open up that window back there and I would just look out and see green branches. I mean, it was crowding out the house. Bugs could be back there. I couldn't even see out of that window. So what we needed to do is we needed to, to cut some branches. We needed to, to prune this tree a little bit. Here's a couple of words I want us to think of as we begin. Prune, declutter, simplify. Are there any ways that we can simplify our lives? Are there any ways that we can begin to empty that cup out a little bit? I mean, here's the truth. There's always going to be things in our cup. Responsibilities that we have, appointments we have to go to, work, grocery shopping, bills to pay. Yeah, yeah, there's always going to be stuff in the cup. But can we find a way to begin emptying some of it out so we actually have space here to receive? Any ways that we can declutter or simplify I love this. There's a book, uh, Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. I always get a good chuckle out of that one. Amusing Ourselves to Death. The amount of entertainment we have available to us is astronomical. I remember overhearing someone one time in the coffee shop. They were, they were talking to someone else and they're like, hey, we just, you know, me and my husband, we just finished this series and now we're asking, what do we binge next? <laughs> You know there's too much entertainment when that's the question that you're asking. What do we binge next? How about we take a break from binging? And how about we have some conversation? <laughs> how about we uh, go for a walk outside? Go for a walk in the woods? How about we uh, fill our lives with something other than mindlessly staring at a screen for hour upon or hour after hour? Amusing ourselves to death. I mean, how many apps do we have on our phone? How many games do we go to? Whenever we're bored, it's like, well, I'll play a little, uh, is, what's that, Candy Jewel? I never played that. Is, that. is that the name of it? Candy Crush, that's the name of it. Anyone ever been addicted to Candy Crush? A little confession time? <laughs> Amusing ourselves to death. Is there any way that we can empty a little bit of that entertainment out so we have space to listen? Uh, here, here's a few questions for us as we begin. Where can I carve out some space for silence to listen and receive? And, you know, I, I feel like I'm always, like, I, I debated whether or not to put this question in here because I feel like I'm always talking about space for silence and to listen. But maybe you're like me, and you think about it, and you're intentional about it for a couple of days, for a week, and then a month goes by, and you found that you're filling the cup with something other than room for silence. And so we need to be reminded again. I, I know I have to be reminded. If I'm not intentional 
about creating space, well, then I'm going to fill that space with something because every single void desires to be filled with something. And if we're not intentional about what we're filling the void with, well, then it's going to be a little more entertainment or something else that uh, might not give us the ability to listen and to receive. So uh, where can I carve out some space for silence? Where in your life, in your schedule, can you get a few minutes just to be silent, to be reminded that we're here to receive? We're here to listen to what's happening within us and then take a step with that which the Spirit is speaking to each of us. Uh, here's another question. Where can I eject? I love it. I love this one. <laughs> this one made me laugh. It's like an ejector seat. Uh, what can I eject out of my life? I'm sure there's probably some people that you're like, yeah, I wish that they could just sit in my front seat ejector seat. I'll press the button eject them out of my car. Yeah, what, what can I eject out of my life? And we're talking eject. I, I wanted to use that word because we're talking about forceful because it's been there and it's time to let it go. It's been there for too long and you've thought about it, but you have to hit that button and you need to see that thing, whatever it happens to be, go flying out the window. Uh, see, what isn't producing the life it promised? So many things up front, they promise something that's appealing, it's enticing, and that's why we step into them. But then the, the longer we walk with it, the decision that we made, the thing that we're engaged with, along with what we realize, ooh, the thing that it was promising, the thing that up front looks so good, it's not delivering on that promise. So what isn't filling you with those nine fruits that you have right there? Because if we're being honest, isn't that the type of life that we all truly want? I mean, these nine qualities, I don't know anyone who would say, yeah, I don't want any of those. No. You don't wake up in the morning and be like, you know what? Love? Eh, I don't want to be a person. It happens as you walk a particular path. And the trench gets a little deeper with every pass. You know, we all begin w w with these this desire to be a loving, peaceful, patient person. So what is not filling you with those qualities eject it. It's time for that to go. And then here's another question for us. What yes, and this is similar, what yes has run its course and now it's time to say no? Sometimes we, we're really good at saying yes. We're like Jim Carrey and yes man. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Maybe there's a season for it, trying new things, sure. But eventually, y you say one too many yeses. And then you take on another yes, and life becomes an obligation. The things that you said yes to that seemed like they were going to fill you with life, well, now they become simply a duty, an obligation, another responsibility. And so the life that you have within you, it's being dragged down. It's being weighed down because you've said yes one too many times. And those yeses, they will slowly creep up on you. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> You know, sometimes it's best to say, you know, let me think about that one. And I've been learning to actually say no. <laughs> I used to be really bad at this. But, I mean, there's a lot of power in a no. And it can fill you with life because you get to decide what you will say yes to and what you'll say no to. And there, there's, that's empowering because you come to realize you do not have to say yes to every ask that comes your way. Um, so I, I remember, uh, here's this staying too long versus leaving at the right time. There's been a couple times in my life when I knew it was time for something to go. I had been saying yes to it for a while, and I knew it was time to say no, but I didn't say no early enough. I was part of a, uh, of a youth bureau for a while, and I'd go sit in these meetings every single week, and it was like the life was just being drained out of me. And I knew months ago it was time for me to leave. It was time for me to use that time to do something else with, something that was more filling. Uh, but I just kept saying yes out of duty and out of obligation. And I'd walk out of it and it was, uh, it was like I was drenched after a 90 degree humid day. It was like uh, everything was just dripping out of me. And then when I was a youth pastor, I knew my time was up. And I went, I told the church, I told the board, and I said, hey, I, I think the, the next thing is, is beginning to emerge. And 
my last couple of months with the youth group were amazing because I had said my time is ending. I knew when it was time to say no, when it was time to move on to something else. Sometimes there's things in our lives that we've been saying yes to, and this is the season to begin saying no so that you can empty that cup, so that you can have more space. Uh, look at that. <laughs> so, as we begin our series, I want you to carry that paper with you. Uh, make those words look beautiful in however you feel fit. Carve out an hour. Make some art this week. Please send a picture. Uh, and then carry this cup with you and allow it to remind you that the place to start with the fruits, the life of Jesus, the life that you desire within, the life the Spirit desires to offer, it starts with a cup that's empty, with room for us to receive all the good that God has for you.